My topic this evening is what does the Feast of the Annunciation and together with it the Incarnation of the Lord have to do with my spiritual life? And the first answer to this question is found in the hymn for the feast, the Troparion, and that the Troparion begins, today is the beginning of our salvation. So the connection is quite profound. The connection between this feast and our spiritual life is profound because the connection with our salvation is profound. Liturgically speaking, this is the feast which is seen to be the beginning of the unfolding of the plan of salvation because this marks the incarnation of Christ. And so the Orthodox Church sings this hymn, Today is the beginning of our salvation, not at Christmas, at the Feast of the Nativity of the Lord, which is, I suppose, where some people might be inclined to put it, but moves it back to the incarnation. I'd like to, secondly, that's the first answer. The first answer is the troparion, a very simple but profound answer. The second one uh, is a connection which we read about in the life of St. Anthony by St. Athanasios the Great. Here, St. Athanasios is taking up something which we see very clearly in Holy Scripture and was one of the great themes of the great fathers of the Church. So here I'm citing the text, The Life of Antony by St. Athanasios the Great. Working with Antony was the Lord who bore flesh for us and gave to the body victory over the devil so that each of those who truly struggle can say, It is not I, but the grace of God that is in me. You notice that St. Athanasios says, because this is, these are his words, often he quotes St. Anthony, but here is the commentary which he is giving. Working with Anthony was the Lord who bore flesh for us. And so he grounds his commentary, this is at the very beginning of the life of St. Anthony, in the Incarnation. The rest of the life of St. Anthony, which is really worth reading if you've never had the chance to do so, it's a classic of Christian spirituality. The rest of the life of Anthony has this as its theological premise, which is that because of the Incarnation, the body, physically in other words, the body has received victory over the devil so that each of those who struggle can say it is not I but the grace of God that is in me. And so the Incarnation is the beginning of the ascetic life, the beginning of the life of struggle. The Incarnation grants us the power to fight sin. The Incarnation is already a victory over the devil. Of course, we are looking forward to the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Lord to represent the, which embody the final, full victory. But the Incarnation is already the beginning of that victory over the devil. So for us, the connection with the spiritual life is again quite profound in that because of the Incarnation, we have received from Christ, from Christ, the authority over sin. I would not say we have the authority over sin. I think all of us in this room would have discovered by now that this is not the case, but that we have received from Christ the authority over sin and the victory over the devil. Thirdly, a quotation from St. Gregory the Theologian, also called the Nazianzen. This is actually a small part of a longer quotation, but many of you will recognize this part. Speaking of the Incarnation, St. Gregory writes, what is not assumed, in other words, taken up, 
is not healed. There is, as I mentioned, a larger quotation here. What is not assumed is not healed. The Lord took everything up in the incarnation except sin. So the Lord is fully human in every respect, but does not carry sin. This does not make him less human. This makes him more human, actually. But he has assumed all that is properly speaking human, because what is sinful is not properly speaking human. We have to always know the context for these things in the, in the fathers. So let's take that statement, what is not assumed is not healed, and ask the question, what has been taken up? What has been assumed? The body, we already heard about that from St. Athanasios. The soul, the fathers of the church were very, very strict about defending the integrity of the incarnation, saying that the Lord had and has a human soul. This was in dispute in as much as some of the heretics denied this. And it gets a little bit more exact than that because associated with the soul is something that the fathers called the nous in Greek or the spiritual intellect. It's a very hard word to translate into English, but we might use that word. Some people translate it as mind, but that might be a little bit, a little bit misleading. And again, some of the early heretics would not allow that the Lord had a human noose, but the fathers were very strict about this. And so what we end up with is that what has been assumed, body, soul, noose, or spiritual intellect, mind, I'm using that as something a little bit different, will, in other words, all of the aspects of humanity have been assumed, and we know from this quotation, are being healed. What is not assumed is not healed. If all of these things are assumed, then they are healed. This is, is fantastic news for us in the spiritual life. Of course, we ought to realize that our experience of this does not come without struggle and is not instantaneous. You know, we can't stand up and say that we are healed completely, although the potential for that, the, in other words, the full weight of the healing is given. It's not that it's being held back, but our integration of it is another story. And part of the reason why we practice asceticism is precisely to integrate, to, to receive all of these aspects of humanity are being healed and those who are baptized and those who struggle to use the words of Saint Athanasios. We ought to know that because we ought not to exclude any of the aspects of our persons from, from the Lord, from sanctification. Fourthly, through the incarnation and his baptism, the Lord receives the Holy Spirit as a man. Notice, as a man. Of course, when you ask the, the question, is the, is, is the Lord in his divinity not always fully in communion with the Holy Spirit and the Father, the obvious answer is yes, of course he is because he is one in substance, one in essence, one in existence with the Father and the Holy Spirit. But of course, we profess the Lord as being one person in two natures. And we know that the Lord received the Holy Spirit as a man when he was baptized. Well, it's the only proper way to understand the scriptural text that when he came out of the water, 
that the Holy Spirit descended upon him in the form of a dove. So he's receiving the Holy Spirit as a man. And to put it in very simple terms, now we can as well because of this, because he as a man, St. Athanasios calls him the lordly man, not just any man, but the lordly man. He as a man receives the Holy Spirit and this makes it possible for us as human beings, human persons, to receive the Holy Spirit as well. This is, of course, the, the reception of the Holy Spirit, the acquisition of the Holy Spirit is, is one of the great goals of the spiritual life. Saint Seraphim of Sarov, who was very familiar with many of the fathers, by the way, which is why we see, to use the technical term, patristic, patristic themes, themes from the fathers recurring in the discourse of Saint Seraphim, is he knew them well. He knew scripture well, he knew the fathers well. And so he says that the goal of the Christian life is the, is the acquisition, the word in Russian, stjazhanie, the acquisition of the Holy Spirit. That's the goal. Of course, it's something we need to be doing all of the time. So it doesn't work, you know, simply like something that is done only at the end. But the stjazhanie, the acquisition, is beginning now and increasing precisely so that we can finally acquire. And even when we finally acquire, we never acquire fully. Saint Seraphim understood that. You and I are created. We can't acquire the uncreated fully can't acquire the Holy Spirit fully. We can acquire the Holy Spirit according to our capacity. That would be the more theologically correct way to express it. And so the incarnation, to go back to the theme of the incarnation, is critically important because the Lord is the great events in salvation history allow us as human persons to fully participate because of the Lord's incarnation. Fifthly, we have a very mysterious and I might add terrible, terrible in the sense of frightening moment, awesome moment, I guess would be the best word in English, on the cross where where the Lord says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Here, Christ, again, as a man, this would not be possible without the incarnation, obviously. When we keep saying in the church that the Lord was crucified in the flesh, why do the liturgical writers insist on this? People today would say, if they knew what crucifixion was, would say, how else are you crucified if you aren't crucified in the flesh? But the constant emphasis on the reality of the crucifixion, on his humanity, and on his participation, shows us that the Lord who was himself sinless, nevertheless, went through the experience of abandonment precisely so that you and I would never experience it. And so what was other to him, he accepts to himself, even though he is himself sinless. And in his divinity, of course, he's not ever abandoned by the Father. But he undergoes the experience in his humanity in order that you and I would never know what that experience is. He enters Hades, the fathers of the church say again, as a man, as a man. But there we see that, that, that Hades was embittered 
when it tasted of his flesh. St. John Chrysostom writes in his famous Paschal homily, Hades was embittered when it tasted of his flesh. Well, it wouldn't be tasting of his flesh without the incarnation. So to go back to this, the impact on our own spiritual lives is huge. Because the Lord, as a man, entered Hades and, as God, closed it down. Hades is closed. The experience of abandonment or separation from God has been resolved, has been taken up. Atonement has been made. And this releases every Christian into a freedom, spiritually speaking, which very few Christians ever really come to enjoy fully. And by enjoy, I mean to experience. But it is quite profound. Sixthly, the church itself as the body of Christ is the extension of the incarnation and our spiritual life takes place in the church. This is where we receive the Holy Spirit. This is where we receive the medicines of the church, the sacraments, everything that the Lord has given the church for the healing of the human person in Christ. And when we in the Orthodox Church call the church the body of Christ, we don't mean it simply as some kind of poetic illustration. We honestly understand that the church is engrafted into Christ, and that the head and the body are joined, and that while we cannot say we are Christ in the church, neither could we say that we are ever separated from him because the head is never parted from the body and the body, we pray, never parted from the head. And so the church is the extension of the incarnation and as we are baptized into Christ, we put on Christ and we are engrafted into the church, we are reaping spiritually all of the benefits of the Incarnation, if I may put it in, in, in such a way, because we enter into it. It is not something which is external to us anymore. The, through baptism we enter into it. And of course, finally, and in the seventh place here, the Eucharist is in a very special way an extension of the Incarnation, makes the Incarnation real in a very physical sense for us, in that when we receive the Holy Eucharist, we become participants or communicants, that's what a communicant is, a communicant is a participant in the perfect deified humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our humanity, which carries corruption and needs to be healed, is healed through his perfect humanity. So this also is a major goal of the spiritual life, is to enjoy and to participate in this healing by participating directly in the incarnation, if you like, through the Eucharist, or to be maybe a little bit more precise, through becoming communicants in the deified humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see here, 
It's important to understand in the spiritual life that the Lord did not create something separate from us, other to us, to help us in the spiritual life. In fact, God comes to us himself. God gives himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So God gives himself. The only, the only thing or the only way, rather, to heal corrupted humanity is through incorrupt humanity. That's, this is the only way, through an internal healing, if you like. And when you and I are participants in the Eucharist, we, of course, receive the incorrupt or deified humanity of the Lord Jesus. And this deified humanity of the Lord Jesus fights, if I may put it in an almost medical sense, the corruption that you and I experience. And we know that Christians from the very first century understood the Eucharist in this way because St. Ignatius of Antioch, who is a very, very early father, very early, calls the Eucharist the medicine, the word he uses in Greek is pharmakon, the medicine of immortality. Well, how is the Eucharist the medicine of immortality? It's the medicine of immortality through our participation in the risen Christ. And the mode here is the participation in his deified humanity, which therapeutically treats or saves, if you like, our own humanity, which unfortunately is enduring the effects of corruption. <laughs>